Amen. 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 Tonight, tonight, there was a word from the Lord. I kind of struggled a little bit with this, and I'll explain why. Um, the scripture is going to be coming from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Tonight, we're going to be talking about overcoming the spirit of bitterness. Oh, ouch. Ugh. Ugh. That's what I said, too. Overcoming the spirit of bitterness. Ooh, ain't it heavy deep? Deep said that's heavy. Ooh, Lord, it's heavy. But we got to get there. Amen? Listen, bitterness is a hidden poison that can take root in our hearts, take root in the hearts and the spirit of believers, slowly spreading and affecting every part of our life. It often stems from unresolved hurt, betrayal, disappointment. If left unchecked, bitterness can start to separate us from God's peace. It can start to distort our relationships. And it can even hinder our spiritual growth. So tonight we're going to see and talk and discuss how to recognize, how to confront, and how to overcome the spirit of bitterness by allowing God to heal and to restore us to our proper place in him. Now I say I struggled because, you know, the last couple of weeks, you know, y'all had me preaching on a Wednesday. We talked about praise and we talked about worship. and We had just such a high time in the spirit, even in our Bible study. And I'm like, God, you want me to deal with bitterness? Oh, goodness. Bitterness. So heavy, just so whatever. You know, it's just deep. It just get on you. Bitterness. Say, yes, I want you to deal with bitterness. Because all that shouting, all that jumping, all that screaming, you'll never worship me, praise me, the way that you should, as long as bitterness is an anchor in your heart. <sighs> Y'all might as well breathe. <clears throat> you might, might as well breathe tonight. Listen, Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 31 and 32 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, just, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Now, in order for us to really get into this and really receive the benefit of the word tonight, I have to make sure we have a consensus in the room. I have to make sure this is the right night for us to go ahead and do this and tap into this. So I want to ask a question. And by a show of hands, usually I don't ask you to raise your hand, but I want you to raise it tonight. I want to know how many of us in this room, you know without a shadow of a doubt that you have been a recipient of God's forgiveness. Don't play with it now. Don't fool with me. You know without a shadow of a doubt that God has forgiven you for the things you did willingly, the things you didn't even realize you did. You know that you've been a recipient of God's forgiveness. One more time by a show of hand. All right, we're talking to the right people tonight. We are talking to the right people tonight. Like I was saying, when God gave me this lesson, it just was a lie. To me. But this is something that we all deal with. This is something that the enemy would try to put in our life to begin to push us away from where God would have us to be. So we have to learn how to overcome the spirit of bitterness. So y'all just take another deep breath and let's ride. Listen, we all often overlook bitterness because it's not easily identifiable. It's not like anger because, you know, anger can be loud. 
anger can be uh, very noticeable. But bitterness sometimes can just go unnoticed for years. People can deal with damaging effects of personal relationships in a way that cause you to have some real issues in your spiritual life, in your emotional life, and your physical life. Dr. MLK once said, never succumb to the temptation of bitterness. And we know that Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. dealt with a lot of mistreatment, a lot of abuse, a lot of uh, evil that was just done towards him and against him. But he understood if we give into the temptation of bitterness or allow it in our life, then you limit what God is really wanting to do in and through you. In a real sense, it's important to understand that Jesus is the most perfect example for so many things, but he's definitely an example for living a life free of bitterness. Isaiah lets us know he calls him a, a you know, the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, verse 5. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his by his stripes, we are healed. The life of Jesus was one that refused to harbor hate, to harbor resentment. When we look at the example of who Jesus was, when we look at how they came up against him, everything that he was trying to do, somebody was speaking against it. You shouldn't be doing this on the Sabbath. You shouldn't do that. Blah, 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 blah. They were doing all kinds of things. They even crucified him, killed him, spit on him. And he still was able to look at them and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, have mercy on them, because they don't have a clue. He was a perfect example of how we should live our lives free of bitterness. When we think about the pain that he had to endure, when we think about the pain and disappointment that we have to endure in our everyday life, we think about all the things that have happened in our lives. We have to come to a place where we believe what David said in Psalms 37. Verse 1 and 2, David says, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die. Translation, translation stop worrying about the ones who did you wrong. Stop giving so much attention and so much emphasis on the ones who uh, betrayed you or what have you because in due time, God is going to deal with it. Now, he may not deal with it the way we want him to deal with it, but we have to trust God enough to know that, God, you're going to deal with this situation concerning me. He'll be the one to determine the grass too high and decide to cut it down. I don't care how much you pray, God, cut them down. Cut them down. Get them, God. Mow them down. Get them out of here. Kill them. Let them with them. He is the one that's going to determine how he deals with those who have maybe caused an offense against us. We have to understand that we have to allow and be willing to let God be God. We trust him. In this area, we trust him. In that area, we got to trust him in every area of our life. We've got to make a decision to allow God to be God. God, however you choose to handle it, I'm going to let you handle it. Whatever you choose to do, I'm going to let you do it. Now, y'all can clap. Y'all can say amen, but that's a task. That's a task. Because a lot of times we'll harbor things in our heart because God didn't deal with it the way we thought he should. But God, I felt like they should have got hit by a car. And it looked like you blessing them, prospering them. I feel like, you know, we should have read their name in the newspaper somewhere. And sometimes, I know y'all ain't, ain't going to be honest about it, but I'm, I'm telling my truth tonight. We can feel those things in our hearts. And God wants us to deal with that. Because as long as that's there, you cannot reach the place God wants you to reach. We got to dig that up out of our heart. Listen, too often we try, <laughs> we get so busy trying to be God and trying to inflict judgment on people 
because we know what's best and we think we know what's best. But really, we just really have to let God be God. Part of overcoming bitterness is getting to the root of bitterness. And that can be painful. That can be a task. But I believe at the end, there is going to be victory in your life. But we have to first be honest and really deal with some of the things that are trying to deal with us. Listen, first, I want to talk about tonight, how does bitterness begin? Bitterness usually begins with offense. Not a fence, but offense. Like you've been offended. The offense will then lead to unforgiveness and will ultimately result in bitterness. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19 says, A brother offended is harder to, to win than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a castle. Bitterness is the result of unresolved issues, which in most cases could have been resolved long before it turned into bitterness. But for whatever reason, we decide, you know, and I, you know, I'm talking to all of us tonight. Sometimes we just decide not to deal with a thing the way we ought to deal with a thing. And it becomes a small thing can become such a major thing in our lives because we have not dealt with it. It started out as a small infraction, just a little thing, maybe a small little misunderstanding, maybe a misinterpretation of what was said. Now it has turned into this thing called bitterness, unforgiveness, and sometimes even sin. I want you for a moment tonight. To be honest, I want you to reflect. See, tonight is not a night, a good night to do the church thing. And y'all know what I'm talking about when I say doing the church thing. Coming here and just, you know, glory be to God. God is so good. God is so gracious. How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. Tonight is not a good night to do the church thing. Because tonight we really want to begin the process of dealing or allowing God to deal with us to really allow God to reveal us, reveal to us, us. But I want you to think about an offense. Right now, I want you to think about a person, a situation that really offended you. I know there may be a lot of things that have offended you in life, but I want you to think about that thing that's still tender that thing that is still raw to the touch, that thing if you think about it a little bit too long, yeah, that thing, I want you to pull that up in your spirit tonight. Because sometimes we do such a great job of suppressing it and pushing it down. But God desires to deal with that thing. He desires to deal with that thing. And sometimes we push it down so far till we can't deal with it. But I want you to take a moment. Think about it. Now, I'm not going to ask you what it is. I'm not going to ask for no names, times, dates, or places. And, and don't you think about it so much that you want to tell your neighbor what it is. <laughs> That's not what this is about. But I want you to really think about that thing. The thing you still feel. The thing that's still sensitive to the touch. I don't care what it is. Let it come up. It could be about a parent be about a child. It could be about a job. It could be about your pastor. Somebody in your church. I want you to get that in your spirit. I know it's not a pleasant thought. I know it's not easy to really confront and to face that, but let it come up. And while it's on your mind, let's look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Verse number 15 through 17, very familiar. And listen to what Jesus says to do with those thoughts and those things that we've allowed to come up. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17 says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. The way that works is if there is an offense and somebody has hurt you, don't let it fester. 
don't allow it to turn into bitterness. Don't allow it to turn into unforgiveness. But go take the initiative to deal with it. I'm not talking about sending a text message or email or anything like that. Go talk to them. You know, a lot of times some of the things that we say get lost in translation when we send it in a message. It's something about going to look into a person's eye and saying, listen, I don't even know if you even realize this, but when you said that, this made me feel like this. That does something. Something about going to sit down with somebody, having enough integrity, having enough love and appreciation for the relationship that you all have built and have or whatever to say, hey, I owe it to you to tell you how this has made me feel. Because I'm not going to be the same until we deal with this. <sighs> now that person says to you, oh, I'm sorry. I, I really didn't realize that was the case. Or, I'm sorry. I just said something crazy. I was a bonehead. I was in my emotions. I had a moment. You just won a brother. Just one or sister. That relationship that y'all ha have had becomes deeper. Secondly, the Bible says in verse 16, but if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. The Bible says it's okay if they just want to act up. They want to argue. Next time, find somebody to go with you. Be persistent in getting it right. Be persistent at bringing peace. God has called us to be peacemakers, and sometimes we just try to be peacekeepers. He didn't call you to be no peacekeeper. He called you to be a peacemaker. And sometimes that word make is a forceful word. You got to be persistent in making peace. So if you don't want to hear you, take somebody else with you so you can limit the line. You know, you don't want to have to go back to, you know, they said this, and when they came, they had this kind of attitude. Take somebody else with you. Now, don't go grab your posse and take with you. <laughs> we got to be integral in what we're doing now. You know, you go to them and say, listen, I, now I came to you to have this conversation. So I brought these brothers and I brought these sisters this time just because I'm just trying to get this out. Let's get this settled so we can move past it. Now you have witnesses, because the truth is established by two or three present people. I don't go with, you know, the ones who are going to say, yeah, he said it like this, because they told me they said it like this. No, let them be there. Now you have a witness, so the truth can be established. Verse 17 says, and if he refuses to hear them, take it to the church. Tell the church. And if, but if he refuses even to hear the church, let him, let him be to you like a heathen or a tax collector. Now, if they still don't want to hear you after you don't took your witnesses, the Bible says tell it to the church. Now, let's get this straight. You're not coming up here to get no microphone. <laughs> you shall not get the microphone. That is not what they're talking about. The Bible is saying go to Elder Bush. Go to Elder Peterson. Go to Elder Henry. Go to one of these fine deacons around here. Go to the leadership of the church. Explain to them what's going on. Take one of them with you so that maybe the leadership of the church can mediate this issue. I said, a lot of us go there first. We go to the pastor's office first. You ain't been to them. They don't know that they, ain't, they don't have a clue that they done did anything to you. Now you end up with the leadership of the church. You at step three. And it could have been Saul, step one. <laughs> That's how we have to handle this. After you've done all the Bible has told you to do and instructed you to do, and they still don't care and they still don't want to hear you, wash your hands clean of it. Move on. Do not allow the person sin against you to move you into a place of sin. You can allow what somebody has done to you to move you into a place of bitterness.
bitterness and unforgiveness. Sometimes you have to depart from people. Like, ja- like Jacob and Laban in Genesis 31, 49. <laughs> After years of a strained relationship, they decided to part ways. May the Lord watch. Between me and thee, while we're absent. What, ain't nothing wrong with that. May the, if you got to take you some rocks and build an altar, may the Lord watch. There comes a point where you have to accept the fact that you've done all you can do. There is a point that we can reach where we've done all that we can do. I came to you. You didn't want to hear it. I brought others to you. You didn't want to hear it. I took it to the leadership of the church. You weren't in order. You didn't care about the leadership of the church. It still is what it is. So now I'm washing my hands of it. I'm good now. I'm not letting it, I'm letting it go. I'm not going to allow. I'm not going to live in your environment of mistreatment. I'm done. I'm done. Now that doesn't mean you mean. That don't mean you're indifferent. That don't mean you get to treat them any kind of way. No. I just have an understanding of what our relationship is. <clears throat> and every relationship don't have to be a hug and kiss and one. We ain't got to go to Olive Garden after church. That, you know, that's not for everybody. We are different people. We're made up different. We have different personalities. And that's okay. But we we go through situations to learn, okay, yeah, you're not an Olive Garden person. Yeah, I'm not going to long haul with you. I love you. Love you to death. But we, you, just, you just don't have that. See, people of God, we have to learn how to let people go. But we can't just let them go. We have to also release our feelings of bitterness toward them. Ain't no sense in letting them go and you're going to hold on to all the feelings and the bitterness and the emotions that came along with the situation. We've got to learn how to process all of that through the spirit of God and allow God to do what he has to do in our heart about that situation. We got to, we have to let him do it. Because it's only when we do that that we can truly move towards overcoming this thing called bitterness. bitterness. Now, how do you know when you are in the stages of bitterness? How do you know when you have bitterness in your heart? How do you know that bitterness has come upon you? Let's talk about it. Remember, bitterness is not the starting point, but it's the end result of prolonged feelings, hurt, and resentment. Here are the stages. Number one, oversensitivity to remarks and actions, or maybe even the lack of actions. You become so sensitive, everything bothers you. What they do bothers you. What they didn't do bothers you. Everything bothers you. The fact they're sitting in the church breathing bothers. That's the first sign that you're headed towards a root of bitterness. Taking everything out of context. You're upset at what they're doing, what they're not doing. Number two, the hurt feelings. Everything just hurt your feelings. You're just so tender. So tender. I don't know why y'all looking at me like that. Because we've all been there. Especially if you're one of those people with a huge heart. You're a giver. You love being. You give big. Some people take those feelings you have, ring them out, and throw it in the trash. Number three, you have repulsive feelings towards them. The thought or the sight of them just aggravates you. The sight of them make you sick. Think about them, it just make you sick. You can't get to that place where somebody has done something to you so painful that the thought of them just get on your nerves. People can really take you to that place. People can really do things to you to really take you to that place. But God has an antidote even for that. Then the rehearsal of pain and hurt and disappointment. Every time you get a chance, you, you, you bring it up. You're talking about Rehearsing it, you're going over it and over it and over and over it again. That's a sign that you are headed 
Mexico is a root of bitterness, or you have a root of bitterness. You ever met a person that no matter what you're talking about, they can interject a certain thing in it? Y'all talking about the football game, and she talking about how that man left her in 19. <laughs> You're just like he just had to walk out of there because he got injured. That's just how that joker walked out that house and left. Rehearsing it. The alienation of a person. Once I talk about you, can't stand you, now I can alienate you. I put you in this space of non-existence. You ever had a person <laughs> feel a certain way about you? I have feel a certain way about you, and they just act like you just don't even exist. You, 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 you just, you, you weren't even there. People do that to you. <laughs> and when we put people in that kind of mind frame, it's easier to do this next thing, and that's to slander a person. See, slander is when I start saying things that may not be necessarily true but I'm speaking out of my emotions that I have toward you. I'm speaking out of the feelings that I have toward you. I'm speaking out of the situation that may have gone on between us. Yeah, that sounds like them. Oh, they did it. They did it. That's a, they, I, I know that's them. They did it. <laughs> but then that seventh step or stage in the process of bitterness is a big one. That's a lack of obedience to God regarding those who do wrong against you. When we get to that point to where we don't care, we know what the Bible says. I know what's right. But this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this my way. This is when you literally start doing things God said don't. This is, where, this is when God will send a word to free you of all of that that you're feeling. And you say, oh, God, that's a good word. But I got it. I got it. I'm going to deal with it my way. So the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spiritually use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You want me to do what? You want me to pray for who? Now, see, I don't know about y'all, but there's been times I prayed for my enemy. It ain't quite sound like that. Say, Lord, get them. They done wrong your child. God, you say, vengeance shall be mine. Get them, God. Get them, God. Get them. I don't know why y'all acting like y'all ain't never prayed like that. Y'all ain't never asked God to let somebody's head just fall completely off. Whew. I'm the only one. The only one that told God that I want to have a children of Israel experience. I want to watch the Egyptians drown in the Red Sea. I'm the only one. Y'all laughing. But most times that's how we feel. We may never say it. But that's how we feel. We may never verbalize it. But that's how we feel. And that isn't the spirit of God. You first have to be so sold out to the will of God that you can truly pray for your enemies. And listen, I use that word enemies just for lack of a better word because really we don't have enemies, not that's flesh and blood. You did me wrong. You're not my enemy. Now that spirit pushing you and motivating you and using you, that's my enemy. But we wrestle not. Against flesh and blood. So please understand me when I use that word enemy. But we don't have, shouldn't have no enemy. There should be nobody that we look at as an enemy. 
we have to be in such a place that we can pray, Lord, let them be restored. Lord, let them be restored. Lord, bring them to a place of understanding. God, bring them to a place of maturity. Listen, that's hard, y'all. There's nothing easy about it. That's hard. But that's what God calling us to do. God, help them. Why are you helping them help me? <laughs> Why are you growing them grow me? That's what God is calling for us to do. Bless those who curse you. Woo! Do what? You want the benefits of the kingdom. But sometimes we don't want the responsibility of the kingdom. There's a responsibility to the king. You, you, you've got to really, you can't live a part of this thing. You've got to live all of it. And the only way we do that is through the spirit of God. There is no way I can pray for somebody who's done whatever to just devastate me without absent of the spirit of God. I may be able to say words that don't mean nothing. But to really want God to move and to change and to bless their life, that takes the spirit of God. It takes the spirit of God. And we should want the spirit of God in us to that level that our spirit will pray even when we having trouble. We have to be in such a place to want to see the will of God fulfilled, even in the life of somebody who's hurting us. But the, the root of bitterness will cause you to become like the one you're bitter towards. When we become like the one we despise, you know that you're all the way in the spirit of bitterness. When you start to become just like the one you despise. A victim that does not get help usually becomes a villain. The final stage of progressing, the progression of bitterness, is when you are so consumed with the feelings of bitterness towards a person that you become just as bad as them. It's at this point that bitterness is so deeply rooted in our lives that it takes being very intentional. It takes a very intentional effort to really get it out of our spirit. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Looking carefully, at least anyone falls short of the grace of God. At least any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. See, bitterness is a root. It is the root of you. We have to understand that the devil is trying to get to the root of who you are. He is trying to corrupt the root of who you are. When we start to see bitterness and unforgiveness and offense as a seed, a seed is planted of anger, a seed is planted of unforgiveness, a seed is planted of, of offense, and we just allow it to keep growing and growing and growing and growing. The roots get so deep that when it's finally time, we finally made a decision to face it and to uproot it. We try to go right up to the tree and start digging it up. But you don't let it go so long. The root's all in the neighbor's yard. You got to start way over here to get that tree up. And what we don't understand sometimes is how bitterness, unforgiveness seeps into every area of our life. Seeps into our relationships. Somebody else is now paying the, 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 the interest on the debt that somebody else caused. When we don't truly allow God to deal with the things that are in our heart, the things that have gone on with us, it seeps and goes over to our marriages and how we raise our children and on our jobs and in our church functions and departments seeps over into our self-esteem and our self-worth. 
the enemy desires to corrupt the root of us with unforgiveness. It'll start impacting everything that we do. I want you to understand this. Bitterness is not always a visible emotion. But over time, the more it grows, the more difficult it is to control. When bitterness is unchecked, it shows up in our character and our conversation. The enemy is trying to control your actions. Here is the characteristics of a person who is dealing with bitterness. Now listen, if you got one of these characteristics, I'm not saying that you're bitter. Just, just check it out. Just check it out. Check it out. Now they care very little about the person that they're bitter against. Hey, did you know so-and-so is in the hospital? Mm. You know so-and-so, mom and them die. Mm. What you telling me for? Care very little about the person who has done whatever injustice against them. Often found to be very sensitive. Very, very sensitive. The person that hurt you, name was Charles. It was 10 years later. This man on your job introduced himself as Charles. Now, you don't like this Charles because of that Charles. <laughs> because he said Charles, it done sent you on a roller coaster of emotions. A person that's bitter can be ungrateful because you've been so offended, you've been so hurt. You form a sense of entitlement because of what you've been through and the pain that you felt and had to deal with. Now you feel like you are entitled to whatever, to the point you're almost ungrateful. Hmm. I deserve this based on all the pain I've been through. Man, we have to pay attention to these things. Gives empty flattery or harsh criticism. Oh, hey, how you doing? Y'all know how we do. Holds grudges and finds it difficult to forgive. You'll be amazed at the kind of grudges people will hold. Whew. You'll be amazed at the type of grudges people will hold. They display, display stubbornness and nasty attitudes, just stubborn, don't care what nobody say. Won't help or complain when asked to help, you know, because that bitterness will cause you to stop being helpful because you feel like if I am helpful, then I run the risk of being hurt like I was before if I did this, I... You go through all of that. Let me help you understand something that affects a bitterness. Bitterness does more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than the vessel from which it was poured. That resentment, that anger, that unforgiveness that we choose to hold on to, we choose not to release to God, it's doing more damage to you than it is to the person who did it to you. It's like a faucet that hasn't been used for a long time. Corrosion building all up in it. You turn the water on, the brown water coming out first. Dirty water coming out first. The corrosion coming out first. And sometimes we get up here, we worship God, and don't even realize the brown water coming out first. That praise, that worship, it's not pure because it's corroded. Sometimes we can get up here, sing in the choir, sing praise and worship, and not even realize the brown water coming out first. I done been in some service with some bitter preacher. They done talked about everything and everybody except Jesus and God. Brown water coming out first. We can't afford to allow that kind of corrosion in our life. What we're talking about tonight is tough. It's not easy. But if we truly want to be who God has called us to be. We got to deal with it. We got to deal with it. We got to let God uproot it. We have to let God, we have to give it to him. <laughs> so the brown water not coming out first. When we hold on to bitterness and don't deal with it, we are ultimately giving the person or the situation the authority over our life. Most of the times the offenders have died, they moved on with their life, they somewhere on a beach somewhere, and we're in a miserable state because we're choosing to hold on 
to what they did to us. Listen, I want you to hear me today. You will never experience the release of bitterness until you start waiting on an apology. Sometimes we are waiting on apologies that are never going to come. You will never overcome the spirit of bitterness as long as you are waiting for an apology because as long as you are waiting, you're still carrying it. I'm not doing this until they say I'm sorry. I ain't got nothing to say to them until they fall at my feet and tell me they wrong me. You'll be waiting forever in some cases for some people to come and apologize. Ephesians chapter 4, 26, 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. God gives you permission to be angry. You can be angry. Listen, some stuff is you got to be angry. Some of the stuff we've dealt with, some of the stuff you've gone through, some of the stuff you faced, you should have been angry. Anger is a part of life and living. God gives us permission to be angry. You can be angry with them. You can be angry at that situation. You can be angry at that. You can be mad at the dog. You have permission to be angry. But this is the hard part. Don't allow the anger to move you to action. Don't sin because of the anger. And this is something that we all should be trying to get right because it is not easy. It is not easy, and it's going to be a lifelong task to do. But we have to realize the moment we get angry and sin, you've allowed the devil to manipulate the moment, but manipulate the situation to dictate your destiny. As, look, as soon as you give in to it, or whatever it is, and you sin. You've allowed the enemy to manipulate how you feel and dictate your life because your actions can cost you your entire destiny. God has so many great things in store for you. God has so many great things in store for me that you can't allow anything to take you to that point. But like I said before, we have to have the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is the antidote. Too often we get messed up trying to retaliate, but God says in Hebrews 10 and 34, we know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. The Lord will judge his people. The hardest thing for us to do sometimes is to just let God deal with it. And we know God knows just how to deal with it. He doesn't need you to tell him how to deal with it. He don't need you to volunteer to help him deal with it. We just got to let him deal with it. You leave it alone. You don't act in a way that's simple. The enemy will manipulate your pain, your hurt, your frustration, and cause you to do something crazy. You can sit back all day talking about what you would never do and how you would never act, but I'm sure... A stalker never thought they were going to be a stalker. The car killer didn't think they were going to be a car killer. <laughs> Something had to happen to push them to a certain place. But when we let bitterness sit in, the enemy will use it. He said, go ahead. Go on, do it. Tell them. This is your chance. Tell them. They think you playing. They think you somebody to play with. Y'all ain't never had the devil talk to you like that. Boy, I gives in. Yeah, you know God working on me because I used to give in. Oh, they think I'm playing? You know, you go back, you go to talking back to them. You need, we need the spirit of God. But listen, there's a resolution to this. To really face and to deal with the offense, the hurt, the violation, the unforgiveness, the offense, the pain, we have to really deal with it. Bitterness can become so deeply rooted in us, and to properly deal with it, our prayers to God should be Psalms 139, 23, and 24. Search me. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. 
and lead me in the way everlasting. Our prayer should forever be, Lord, show me myself. Show me me. See, when you are focused on you, that's the less time you have to point your finger at somebody else. Let God deal with you. Show me, God, the error of my way. The, the scripture, that is Psalms 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, we are good at camouflaging our hurt behind religion and spirituality. We're good. We try to use all that spiritualization to mask and to cover up some of the deepest hurts that we've experienced and we've felt. Listen, if you have chicken pox, we can put you in a dress from Gucci. We can put you in a tailor-made suit. You're going to look good, but you still going to have chicken pox. Still going to have chicken pox. Because until you deal with the issue, it doesn't matter how you try to cover it up. Still going to be there. We need the spirit of God to overcome the spirit of bitterness. That is something that we need. We need the Spirit of God. This cannot be done in our own power. Our nature causes us to be bitter. Our nature causes us to hold on to the things that somebody has done or said or situations that weren't favorable and let it stir up and take root in our life. That's our nature, but we got to get past our nature. See, we got to go past our birth and into our creation. See, with some things that we were born with, born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Well, see, the Spirit of God will take you past your birth and take you back to when you were created perfect in the image of God. Woo! Sometimes we spend too much time trying to live according to our nature and not the Spirit of God. That should be rooted in our belly, causing us to live a life that only he can live through us. Whew. Bitterness. I keep saying how important it is to be filled with the Spirit of God. This is why. These are all of the reasons why. We need the Spirit of God. We can't live the life that we're supposed to live without the Spirit of God. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You've got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That is the ultimate source of your conviction. The Holy Ghost is going to tell you, hey, are you trying to hide it? Are you trying to dance over it? Are you speaking in tongues over it? Are you feel the spirit over it? But it's there. Deal with it. Woo. Deal with it. Cause you to deal with it. it. Won't let you have peace. Keep you up at night. Y'all ain't never been there. See, I done been in those situations where God calls me to toss and turn about some things. I know them people did to me. <laughs> they did that to me. But how I felt about it and how I let it seep down in my spirit and, and what it started to cause me to become, God didn't allow me to have peace with that. The spirit of God in me say both of us can't live here. Darkness and light not going to dwell together. You got to deal with that. Ha! Roshana la basa. You got to deal with that. God is desiring to take us to a whole nother place. But you are not going with that. God, why did you give me this kind of word to come in here on the ministry? I could have did. Let me write a book, a devotional, or something like that. <sighs> no. This is where I am with my people. This is where I am with my people. I want to deal with the innermost part of you. 
I want to deal with that thing that's trying to deal with you. Because as long as it's there, you won't reach the place that I predestined for you to reach. I've got to call it to your attention since you want to act like you don't know it's there. Call it to your attention. Now you have the responsibility for what you heard. You got to deal with it. The way we do that is through the Spirit of God. We got, now hey, sometimes it may require you sitting on somebody's couch. Because there are some things that people can do to you. I'm telling you that you just got to go through the process of processing what we got to go through so that we can be the light that God has called us to be. Stop allowing what they did to you to diminish your light. Woo. Sometimes we walk around with it so long that we think this is the brightest we can shine. When God has called you to do more, to be more, to have more, when that resentment is an anchor, that bitterness holding you down, God wants us to be free in him. That doesn't mean you're not going to deal with the things of the world or, or, or life. You're going to be mad. You're going to get angry. You're going to be upset. But it gives us a roadmap as to how we deal with it how we handle it, how we go about it, how we don't allow it to become a tree in our life. We have a responsibility to overcome the spirit of, offense, of bitterness. We have to overcome the spirit of bitterness. The enemy will use bitterness to hold you back while you're sitting in church, waving your hand, but not receiving the fullness of what you're supposed to have. He will use bitterness. He will plant things to happen in your life at certain seasons of your life in the hopes that you follow your nature and not how God has created you. We've got to overcome the spirit of bitterness way we do that is by what? The Spirit of God. Y'all can put your hands together.